Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining the second installment of our Sustainable IT webinar series from TCO Development. My name's Claire Hobby uh, from TCO Development. We're really glad you could join us today. And uh, for those of you who are new to our series, we're going to have a series of webinars throughout the year looking at different topics in sustainable IT. Today we're going to be looking at best practice sustainable IT procurement. And we have two speakers today and we will be taking some questions and on the right of your screen you should see a questions field so feel free to answer your, enter your questions there as we go along. Uh, we will hopefully get to all of your questions. If we don't, we will definitely welcome them by email following today's session. I know many of you on the line today are familiar with, uh, with us, with TCO Development and our program TCO Certified. For those of you who aren't, I'll just take a minute to give you a brief overview of our program. TCO Certified is a third-party sustainability certification for IT products. And we have a very broad set of criteria that covers the life cycle of computers, displays, smartphones, and all in all eight categories of IT products. So through manufacturing, use, and end of life phases. Today we'll be looking a little bit closer at our, um, or at the issue of socially responsible manufacturing, both from the perspective of the purchaser and also a little bit from our perspective as a certification and you know how far have we come, what effects are we seeing of, of criteria in the purchasing space and also from the certification space. And our guest speaker will uh, also be looking at sustainability criteria in the purchasing context a little bit closer and what purchasers can expect when using criteria such as these. You can find out complete information about TCO certified, including criteria, test methods, uh, where to get products tested, and what products are certified at tcodevelopment.com. So a quick look at some of the topics we're hoping to cover in our series this year. And thank you again to all of you who have responded and provided feedback and uh, wish lists of topics that you'd like to see covered. Um, we're taking a look at social responsibility, as, as you know, also environment, um, purchasing, best practice purchasing, some good case studies and practical advice. We'll also be looking at verification, and by that we mean verification of compliance of the products that you buy, uh, and also verification from the certification perspective. How do we verify that the factories where certified products are made are also uh, living up to the commitment that they make as far as social criteria go. A little bit later in the year we'll also take a look at some of the long-term sustainability trends that we're seeing and uh, we look forward to sharing some ideas and also soliciting your feedback on some of those as we look forward to developing the next generation of TCO certified criteria. So our agenda for today, again, we'll be looking at best practice, sustainable IT procurement, and we'll be looking at it particularly in the context of a public purchasing entity. And today we're really pleased to have Christian Hemstrom joining us from the Stockholm County Council in Sweden. He's uh, been a, a, a leader in implementing sustainable purchasing criteria in their uh, purchasing program and will be telling us a little bit about that process and also talking about a recent review they did of the program to see what effects they could um, they could conclude from the program and some lessons learned. So hopefully some good practical advice for those of us involved in um, sustainable purchasing. Also looking at what can, what can purchasers expect when you decide to implement 
these kinds of criteria in your program. What should you look to, look to as far as follow-up goes? Uh, how, you, how should you do it? Some of the challenges and some of the benefits of doing that. So some great practical advice from, uh, from Christian today. Then following that, uh, Nicholas Riedel from TCO Development will take a little look at uh, the socially responsible manufacturing criteria in TCO Certified. Uh, how far have we come? What changes have we made? And what do we hope to achieve by those? And also taking a little look at the role of certifications in some of the new legislation out there, such as the EU Purchasing Directive. So again, our speakers today, we're very pleased to welcome Christian Hemstrom from the Stockholm County Council in Sweden. He is the Assistant Director of Sustainability and uh, has really been uh, very much a, a, a leading light in sustainable IT purchasing. So we're looking forward to hearing his, of his experiences. And Nicholas Riedel, um, Director of TCO Development. Uh, Director of TCO Certified, excuse me, here at TCO Development. So Nicholas really has the overall responsibility for the certification program. So with that, once again, enter your questions as we go along in the questions field. And I would like to hand over to Christian Hemstrom and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks, Christian. Thank you very much, Claire. And I'm very happy to be here today. So, I'm from Stockholm County Council in Sweden, and we are responsible for healthcare, public transportation, and regional planning in the Stockholm region. And we are one of the largest employers in Sweden with 44,000 employees. And every day we serve 40,000 healthcare visits and 780,000 passengers in the public transportation system in Stockholm. And, uh, in Sweden, we are in total 21 county councils and regions. And uh, since we are large actors, we consume a lot of goods and services to the amount of approximately 13 billion euros every year. And uh, of course, there are very many challenges in our supply chains when it comes to social responsibility. So I'll just show you some examples first. Uh, in 2007, a review was made uh, from production of surgical instruments in Pakistan, where the labor conditions were really poor and a lot of child labor. And uh, that's when we started our work with uh, social responsibility in public procurement. But also we had a lot of other uh, products uh, that we are focused on. Uh, gloves, for example, in Thailand and Malaysia, where there's been a lot of problems as well when it comes to working conditions. And recently a new report uh, were, was made about chicken production in Thailand. We are now doing an audit on two of our food suppliers. But also pharmaceutical factories in India and China is problematic, especially when it comes to environmental discharge and uh, antibiotic resistance downstream the production facilities. And also there have been several reports on uh, IT supply chain, which we will talk about today. And uh, for example, a report from Dan Watch in 2013 on uh, factories in China that supplies multiple brands. And uh, among those, uh, some of the brands that uh, supply us with uh, computers and other IT products. And also there was a recent uh, Dan Watch report last fall so due to the challenges uh, we have since 2008 a code of conduct which we apply in our contracts and uh, since 2010 this code of conduct is uh, common for all regions and county councils in stock in sweden and uh, it's based on uh, the un declaration of human rights the ilo core conventions and work-related health and safety legislation in manufacturing countries, etc. And uh, when it comes to uh, wages and working hours, we state that the supplier should strive for paying living wages to employers on employees, but no less than uh, national minimum wage. And 
of course, this is a challenge uh, for us to implement that in the supply chain, which we may discuss later during the questions. And uh, we have, uh, up until now, focused on seven risk areas, uh, which are surgical instruments, disposable surgical products, gloves, dressings, textiles, IT and pharmaceuticals. But we also work with construction materials when we build hospitals and uh, trains and buses to our public transportation systems. So we are currently revising this list of uh, prioritized areas. And uh, just having a code of conduct doesn't uh, do much in the supply chain. So we have a process of how we work with this. So our code of conduct are, is uh, applied at contract terms in our supplier contracts. And then we work with uh, follow-ups on uh, some of our contracts. We have 2,500 suppliers, so we cannot do follow-ups on all of them all the time, but uh, we do uh, several follow-ups every year. And then, if necessary, we also do uh, factory audits at the manufacturing site. And if necessary, also, we work with corrective action plans together with our suppliers. And in our contract terms with suppliers, uh, we state that the supplier must have procedures in order to ensure that the production is in compliance with our code of conduct. And these procedures must at least uh, be a, a division of responsibilities at the supplier regarding social responsibility, procedures for risk assessment, uh, that demands are put on subcontractors, which can correspond to our demands, and uh, procedures for monitoring compliance in the, in the supply chain, and procedures for handling non-compliances when they occur. And also we uh, state in, our, in the contract terms that we should have the possibility to do our own on-site audits if necessary. And if we find non-compliances, we have the right to terminate the contracts. But that's not our goal. We, we want to drive development and, and improvements in the supply chain. But it has happened uh, that we have terminated a contract when we don't see the development that we want to see over a long term. So I was asked to mention some challenges and success factors when working with this uh, in public procurement. So I highlighted a few. And uh, it's very important to have the internal organization and competence to work with these uh, questions so that we have the internal capacity to hold our contractors accountable for their human, uh, uh, human rights due diligence processes. And this is, of course, a large challenge also when it comes to the amount of uh, supply you have uh, to have sufficient um, resources and capacity to drive these questions. But it is crucial, of course. And, uh, but one of the success factors is uh, that we cooperate amongst 21 county councils, councils. And we also cooperate with municipalities in Sweden and with other regions in uh, Norway and uh, we are expanding our corporations more and more. And that in these uh, corporations we share audit reports with each other and uh, we also increase our leverage through collaboration uh, since we then become a larger market. And it's also important that we work pro proactive with our suppliers and we have uh, worked a lot with capacity building um, to help those who hasn't come so far in their work with social responsibility and we have dialogue meetings uh, with suppliers before more and more before we go into the procurement process we have hearings for example uh, discussing uh, risks and uh, social and environmental demands that uh, we could apply in the procurement and now when we, we are we, uh, revising our contract terms and our processes, we will have a dialogue with our key suppliers in this process to be transparent. And 
maybe the most important also is uh, to do follow-ups of our contract terms and our code of conduct which is both, of course, a success factor and a uh, challenge. And I'd like to mention a few success factors or success examples. I mentioned surgical instruments before and uh, the Swedish non-government organization Swedwatch. They made a follow-up audit in Pakistan uh, to uh, look at the production producing to uh, the Swedish and uh, British market where social demands are put in the contracts and they uh, saw a definite progress with the no child labor in these uh, factories anymore and the wages were at least minimum wage and uh, the health and safety were significantly improved at the factories but there are still challenges of course minimum wage is uh, not not enough uh, compared to living wage, for example. And uh, if you want to look more into this, exa this example, you can go, you can Google healthcare procurement or go to Swedwatch uh, homepage, and uh, there is a 10-minute movie about their, the follow-up in 2014. And an another positive example is. Uh, when another county council in Sweden, they bought it on the gloves production in Malaysia. And there were a couple of uh, findings there related to uh, human rights and working conditions. For example, forced labor. The company kept the passports for migrant workers and loans that were given to migrant workers to pay for recruit recruitment fees to recruiting agents and the loans were then deducted from the payroll which is a form of forced labor and the migrant worker couldn't leave until they had fulfilled their contract and uh, so we worked with corrective action plans with this uh, with our supplier and uh, most of the findings are corrected and now also the uh, manufacturer ha have make a stance to shift the common practice among glove glove manufacturing companies in Malaysia. So from 2016, they will assume responsibility for all recruiting fees going forward. And uh, that's despite the fact that this practice is lawful according to Mal Malaysian regulation. But as a result of our code of conduct and audit, they did this change anyway to be in compliance with our code of conduct. And now I have count shift slide. Okay, here. And then, uh, as I'm, we, the Stockholm County Council, has made has made an audit on our computer supplier and manufacturer last year. So I won't go too much into detail now because the time is limited. So, but if you want, I can send you a report later and just contact me. And. Uh, just briefly about the results, we uh, we participated as observers on two uh, factory audits in China in EICC audits, and uh, there were some non-compliances, and we identified some improvements when it comes to our suppliers and manufacturers' processes when, uh, for social responsibility, and we have established a corrective action plan together with our supplier, which we're we are now following up on. But we also identified uh, progress when it comes to social and environmental responsibility with our supplier and uh, manufacturer uh, for the last during 2014 and 15. During the process, we uh, reached uh, full transparency, where we could uh, see audit reports and corrective action plans for factories producing goods to our uh, departments. And uh, that's not always the case. It could be quite hard sometimes uh, to get this transparency with suppliers. And uh, we saw an increased supplier engagement in social responsibility with more audits being done during 2014 and 15 and more audits being done in also in second tier production. And the quality, uh, audit quality has increased significantly from uh, self-assessments and 
first and second party audits to uh, only third party and fourth party audits. And also with the social and the environmental responsibility uh, management has been strengthened and the decision making is more uh, strengthened as well. But then we um, think that audits is not the only way to to drive progress in the supply chain. So we also added uh, a long-term plan in our corrective action plan with, with the supplier. So our supplier should present to us, us a report now in May where they describe their goals, strategies and indicators for managing actual and potential risks of violations in the supply chain an account of how pricing and delivery practices reflect social and environmental responsibility goals, an explanation of how the supplier exercises leverage with suppliers to ensure code compliance, and description of how the living conditions and human rights for line workers are, are analyzed and taken in, into account. And also, this, our suppliers should uh, give recommendations of how we as end consumers can help to create a sustainable supply chain. For of course we also play a significant role. We are part of the supply chain. And uh, some of these points we have um, also included in our recent procurement of multifunctional printers. So six months after the contract is um, starting, our supplier should present uh, similar reports to us. Uh, based on their strategies, etc. So I think that's a way of uh, discussing these questions outside of the strict audit uh, or follow contract follow-up. And, but of course, there are large challenges, as we have seen during this process, uh, when it comes to working hours, for example. And uh, we think that uh, increasing wages may be a, a way of mitigating the risk of overtime violations, but which would be interesting to have a dialogue around with uh, the industry and other other buyers and public authorities. And of course, there are a lot of challenges around this: uh, how to manage uh, wage questions or living wages, and uh, how should the business model be. Uh, built up, uh, what is our willingness to pay as end consumers and uh, do we need to have a, a full industry engagement to work with this and not just some brands. And we're hoping for dialogue around that in the future. And finally I would just like to also mention how we work with our environmental criteria in our procurement of computers. Uh, we awarded contract based on the most economically advantageous tender where environmental criteria uh, had a value of 10 million Swedish crowns which is about 1 million euros and that was around 25% uh, of the tender price so it's quite large I would say like a bonus on uh, to meet these ev evaluation criteria for environmental performance and we, uh, we had mandatory environmental demands as well, like Energy Star and uh, Mercury Free products, but these uh, ev evaluation criteria were to push the market even further when it comes to energy, recycled materials and chemicals in the products. And in the future, it would be interesting to, to also include social criteria in evaluation models. We haven't uh, done that yet, or I haven't seen it. Maybe someone has have, but in the future that would be interesting to see if we could use social criteria as well in these kind of evalu evaluation models to promote those who go further. So that's all for me. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Christian. Very, uh, very interesting. Um, we do have a few questions. 
And uh, let me start. We have a couple of questions regarding the audits that you do and the follow-up process that you have. So, Christian, uh, one question is, would you know how many audits you have done since you started using this process? Do you have figures on that? I don't have the total figure now. I know it was 69 last year, 2015. But then uh, it's it's not all of them are factory audits. It's it's many of them are like desktop audits where we look at the procedures of our suppliers and we look at their audit protocols, etc. Uh, that's the most common. But then we also do a couple of factory audits as well every year. And are those audits spread across all the product groups that you deal with, or is that yes, IT yes. products alone? Okay. No, there, we are currently doing follow-ups on 13 IT suppliers in, in Stockholm. So, so we share, like uh, uh, one region do pharmaceuticals one year, and, and one region do textiles, one do instruments, etc. So we, we share it like that, and then we share, share the audit protocols. Okay. Um, the other question about also connected to audits is do you, in your definition, is there a difference between the follow-ups that you do and audits? Maybe yes. you want to explain a little bit more about the follow-up process that you have. The follow-up process is more of a like a desktop audit where we go to our supplier headquarters in Sweden and we look at their processes, do they have everything in place that is, is specified in our contract terms when it comes to procedures for handling social responsibility in the supply chain. And then we look at, we look at uh, the audit protocols from suppliers, the, the audit that they have conducted. And when we do an audit, then, then uh, we conduct the factory audit ourselves or we, we hire a uh, consultant to perform the audit. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, you talked a little bit about your collaboration and sharing of audit reports uh, both within Sweden and also I believe with Norway. One question is, do you see any added value in a broader cooperation along those lines, say in the EU context, for example? Yes, of course. I. I Definitely think think so, and uh, especially when it comes to leverage and uh, and uh, markets. Uh, of course, if you are more more uh, public uh, departments cooperating, then then and, and if we have the same kind of uh, criteria, then it's also easier for our suppliers to meet meet our demands um, than if we, if we have. A, very different demands depending on what country you are in. Right. Uh, we've got a few questions here, just trying to get, get to as many as we can. One question about uh, audits again is how do you deal with any suppliers that maybe are reluctant or even refuse to open the doors for audits? Let's say that can be at the factory level but also documentation level. Um, yes, that, that is a challenge and we are having, or actually Norway is having uh, such a challenge now in one medical device uh, uh, supplier who do not want us to do audits or them to do audits. Um, and well, we, um, that, that we could terminate the contract based on that, but uh, we haven't been that tough yet, so maybe that's something we have to to look in, into. But but most of the time, we 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 get the information that we want. But the process can be very time consuming and it takes a lot of time. Uh, so I think we we need to be a bit tougher to say that we want our answers within this time, and and, and then we should stick to that. Sometimes. Right. You can't we are too too kind sometimes. To, okay, a couple of more weeks, one more month, uh, but usually, yeah. Okay. Uh, connected to that idea of 
resource allocation. We have a question. Um, do you have social responsibility experts in your staff to advise or do you have procurement professionals who are expert, have some expertise in social responsibility in depth to be able to do all of this follow-up? How, how do you handle that within your existing staff and resources? We have a uh we have uh, one and soon two people uh, that are national work on a national level, and then uh, we have like experts in in uh, around twelve or fourteen uh, expert experts that uh, in in different county councils and in, in in regions. So uh, I, I am the Stockholm. County Council representative in this expert council. Um, so, and then, but it, it, it depends. In, in some uh, county councils, it's a procurement uh, officer who, who is this expert, and sometimes it's in the environmental department or social sustainability social sustainability department. But. Uh, it's not very common that you're designated just to do this. Often you have something else also that you handle. But uh, we have we get more and more resource, resources. But that, that is a challenge, like I said, to have sufficient amount of resources to work with this question. Right. right. Um, I think we have maybe time for one more question. Thanks everyone for your questions. If your if your question hasn't been answered today, we have a few more than we have time for. Christian's contact information is on the slide here. I'm sure, Christian, people are free to email you uh, with a question. But we have one more uh, before we move on. Christian, could you clarify, um, in Sweden there are 21 county councils. Does that mean you have 21 different contracts for any one product area, or do you align them with the other county councils to make for some best practice supply chain social practices? Um, do you mean yeah, we, if we have separate contracts, all of us? So yeah. does each county council have its own IT product contract, for example? Or do you, do you coordinate in some way? Yeah, it's a bit different. Some of the smaller county councils, they work together, so like five of them uh, share one contract, but uh, in Stockholm, uh, usually we have, we have our own contracts, but but some of the smaller they cooperate and share contracts. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Christian. Very informative, and and I'm sorry we didn't get to every single question today, but uh, just lack of time. But feel, please feel free to email Christian. We will also have an email address at the end of the presentation. You can feel free to email us as well. Uh, for now, let's move on to our next presenter, Nicholas Riddell from TCO Development. He's going to be talking a little bit more in detail about some of these actual criteria, particularly on the socially, social responsibility front. And with that, I will hand over to Nicholas. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I will talk a little about our experiences at TCO Development uh, working with uh, social responsible manufacturing. <clears throat> we introduced criteria on social responsible manufacturing in 2009 and since then we have made a revision every three years to our criteria so we are now on our third generation of social criteria in the manufacturing of IT. And we have been meeting with a lot of purchasers uh, in different parts of the world, mostly the Nordic regions and Germany. And uh, I like to just summarize a few of our observations from talking with the purchasers. And uh, a lot of it is also things that you've heard in Christian's presentation. So um, if you want to work with the uh, social responsible manufacturing and set criteria on it in your procurement, there are certain things you need to think about uh, not to 
expose your organization or brand to unnecessary risks. Because if you set criteria on social responsible manufacturing, like those Christian talked about, uh, demanding the ILO core conventions and the United Nations right of the child convention and so on, these are pretty, pretty basic requests from a buyer uh, that you consider anyone to be able to pass. Uh, but if you if you make those demands in your procurement and you you do not consider these topics that I will list here, there is a risk that you get criticized of your of your procurement and you can have a big problem with that. So let's see what you need. As Christian said, it's very important to have enough competence within your organization so that you can formulate your criteria in a clear way and you can handle any questions you may get from the media, from the buyers, uh, from, from the brands or the factories. And you will also have consequences sooner or later uh, on the criteria you've set. You will have factories that fail your criteria and you need to negotiate with them and handle the situation and, and find solutions that are reasonable to to go on with the cooperation with them. So you need a lot of competence to be able to make these decisions. You also need to have good relations. You need relations with the factories that are producing the products where many of the problems exist. But you also need relations with the brand owners who are buying the products from the factories or some of the brands own their own factories. Uh, with these relations you're able to negotiate and you're, re you're able to, to, fi to, to achieve real improvements in the factories. Then you need to be prepared to follow up the criteria every year during the contract period. For environmental aspects, like for an example, you can maybe do some control in the beginning of a contract and then you're sure that there are no not certain substances or chemicals in the product. But for social responsible manufacturing, there can be problems at the factory any day. So you need to be able to, to do follow-ups continuously over the contract period. Uh, this will cost you money and it will cost you time to do this. Uh, so you need to be prepared to, to invest both time and money to hire people to go to check the factories or to have your own personnel to do this. Then you need to enforce corrective action plans. If there are violations discovered in the factories, these violations must be taken care of in a responsible way. So you need to to discuss with your with your suppliers that they uh, implement corrective action plans in a reasonable time. You need to monitor the implementation of these corrective action plans and you need to have proof when the time is finished that the corrective actions have been successful and the problems have been solved. And then you need to have some consequences if any brand owner or any factory refuse to cooperate with you, refuse to implement corrective actions, refuse to let you into the factories, you need to have some consequences that you can set uh, on those suppliers and, and factories. This is very important. So these things need to be considered before you put social responsible manufacturing criteria into your procurement. In TCO Certified, we are handling all of these aspects for you. Uh, and we have implemented a system that includes several levels of verification. So if you purchase a TCO Certified product, the verification process, the corrective action, the all of this is, is taken care of by the certification program. And I would just go through one slide how the certification program works connected to social responsible manufacturing. First of all, 
the brand owner need to sign a legally binding agreement with TC Development where the brand owner takes the full responsibility for the implementation of social responsible manufacturing in the factories where the TCO certified product is manufactured. Secondly, the brand owner must have a serious code of conduct including the things uh, Christian talked about in his presentation and the brand owner must also ensure that this code of conduct is communicated through the supply chain. That means to translate the code of conduct into the language where the factories are placed and to make sure that the management and the workers are informed maybe through workshops or online education systems. And this has to be proved to TC development that this is done. Then the brand owner must provide a list to TC development of all the factories producing the certified product. And on this list, there must be possible to see that each of these factories are audited at least one time over a three-year period. Many brand owners use a lot of factories, so it's unrealistic to demand all of these factories to be, to be audited every year. What we believe is realistic is to have an audit process where you can uh, audit the factory, spread the audit uh, effort over all of these factories over a three-year period. Every year, the brand owner should send one third-party audit report to TC Development so that we can review that the audit process is made according to all the regulations, that the audit include all the necessary criteria, and also to see the status of the factories, to see that, the, the, that there is progress, that there are no really serious violations, and that uh, from year to year, the situation is, is currently is constantly improving. Then, if there are violations on the factories, and I can say that most of the IT industry, there are different types of violations. Uh, those ones should be solved within a reasonable time through a corrective action plan. So all of the brand owners where, where, who have factories where there are violations should also send a corrective action plan to TC Development where we verify that the corrective actions are implemented in time. Then it's necessary to have the relations I talked about and we decide at TC Development that each brand owner who, TC cert who used TC Certified on their product should appoint one senior management representative and this person should be the responsible person to implement the code of conduct and also report every year in a meeting to TC Development how the progress goes, how the situation is with all the factories, what proactive work the brand owner does to minimize the risk of violations. And this is the, the, the priority contact window for TC Development to discuss social responsible manufacturing with each brand owner. So every year we have a meeting with a brand owner, senior management representative, and we are let each brand owner fill in a questionnaire on proactive work. And this is work that goes beyond the the basic code of conduct. This is proactive work that that differentiate brand owners who who are really engaged in trying to to be to minimize the risk of non-conformities against some brand owners that where there is a bigger risk of non-conformities. The brand owners should also have a public conflict mineral policy where they state how they work with conflict minerals and how they try to minimize the negative impact of conflict minerals in, that are used in their IT products. And on top of that, the brand owners should also have a system where they, uh, where they analyze their processes and their use of conflict mineral according to the OECD guideline, or they can be a part in an in-region initiative to minimize the negative aspects of conflict minerals. And there are a lot of good initiatives in Congo, for example, working to, to make it more difficult for the illegal conflict mineral mines to, to operate.
So you are doing all of this work and uh, then you discover that there are violations and this is the most important part of social responsible manufacturing to work with corrective action plans. Uh, there are a lot of problems in this industry and the important thing is to handle these problems in a responsible way and to improve the situation from year to year and that's what the corrective action plan is for and I think I, I want to make it a single slide for this one because I think it's the most important part of the work. To develop corrective action plans where the factories together with the brand owners and in our case for certification uh, there are three parties. We are also participating in this dialogue and together uh, we try to find solutions to these problems that are often quite difficult to solve. Uh, the benefit of, of TC Certified is that often many brand owners are using the same factory. So instead of when maybe one purchaser is purchasing a small batch of products from a factory, they have limited possibility to affect the factory owner. However, if we coordinate several brand owners that, that produce TC Certified product on the same factory, often we have a much bigger leverage. Maybe we have 60 or 70 percent of that factory's business and all of these brand owners are telling the same thing. They want to solve this problem and we have seen that uh, the factories get much more engaged in trying to find solutions to the problems in this way. A certification system, if you want to use a certification, it's important to use a third party certification and a certification should also follow the ISO 14001 Type 1. That is a standard for, for certifications that you can find on the internet. It describes how the certification should operate, that it should be open source, it should be a multi-stakeholder uh, development of the criteria, all of the criteria should be based on, on scientific principles, there should be a verification by third parties so that there is no way you can cheat um, and there should be annual spot checks where you do random random uh, verification of, of products to see that they fulfill the criteria. So by that I would like to give the word back to Claire. Uh, I would like to show you the email addresses where you can send questions to me if you have questions to my presentation and we have some uh, places where you can also Twitter and, and uh, talk about this seminar. But back to you Claire. Thanks Nicholas. And again if you have a question feel free to enter it in the questions field to the right. You can also email us at purchasing at tcodevelopment.com with any questions. Uh, one question um, that's come in for you, Nicholas, um, is about the corrective action plan process. And specifically, do you take a management system approach requiring root cause analysis, correction, and corrective action? So maybe you can describe the corrective action plan process that, that TCO development works with. Yeah, uh, we have the the goal to be the initiator and we also want to be the the reason to to invest uh, energy in solving the problems. Uh, we don't want to go in and tell the factories exactly what to do. Um, that is also difficult because the factory management believe and with all right that they are the ones who really know how to solve problems. So what we require is that when a violation is found the factory management analyzes the violation together with the auditor that found the violation and those two parties, the, the independent auditor and the factory management, they develop a, fa a corrective action plan together. Uh, then this corrective action plan is sent to one of our 
third-party laboratories. And this verification partner will go through the corrective action plans and make a judgment. Is this corrective action plans efficient or, or is there a risk that it's less efficient? The judgment will be written on a on a on a verification page together with the with the corrective action plan, and then this information will be shared with the brand owner who produced the factories in this factory. So the brand owner can see that there is a pro, uh, corrective action plan that is suggested. There is a timeline, and this has been evaluated and judged by an independent third party who consider it either to be efficient or less efficient, and then. What we do at TC Development is that we monitor this progress. In some cases, the corrective action plan is cons uh, efficient and it solves the problem within the time. In some cases, the corrective action plan is found to be less efficient and there are still some remaining issues when the time is finished. And in that case, we have to evaluate if, we, uh, if it's possible to, to prolong and, and redo the corrective action plan or if the certificate should be withdrawn. And it's our policy that as long as brand owners and factories are engaged and committed in solving the problem and cooperating to solve the problem, they can keep their certificates. But when uh, corrective action plans are, are, are not followed or if a, uh, a brand or, or a factory refuses to cooperate, we are forced to withdraw the certificate for that product. Okay, thanks Nicholas. Uh, run out of time, but hopefully we can get to a couple more questions here. Um, maybe we start with you Nicholas, but I think that could this could be a good question for Christian as well. In general terms, what kinds of effects have we seen from the increased use of social criteria, both from the certification aspect and also in the purchasing context. What kinds of, has there been positive change from industry? What kinds of general trends are you seeing? Yeah, so I'll start there then. What we have seen is that, uh, we have seen, first of all, we've seen that the many brand owners have taken a much bigger responsibility the last years. Uh, we are working with, with uh, 30 or more brand owners. Some of them already worked hard and took responsibility for, social, for the social conditions in the factories when we started this, but many of them uh, started to take more and more responsibilities. And by our uh, system where we have also uh, required uh, that they sign a responsibility and stand behind that. We have increased, we have seen the increased responsibility and increased proactivity in minimizing uh, violations. We've also seen that the factories have been more committed to solving these problems when, when there are several brand owners who have the same demand on them, the same message to them that this must be solved. If it's only one one of their clients, it's less interesting. But when many of their clients come with the same with the same demand, then it's much more likely that they cooperate and and solve these problems in a quick manner. Great, Christian. And did you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I think especially we see in um, some product groups where where. Our supplier started from zero a couple of years ago, so it's been a great progress uh, when it comes to uh, starting to working with the questions, capacity building, building up processes, do, doing audit, starting doing audits, and then audit doesn't solve every, everything, but it's a, it's a tool for improvements. So, like we saw in, in instruments, has definitely been a progress and. Um, also textiles, um, there were a lot of problems back in 2007 and the performance is much better now. But uh, we need to also work with these, how we develop our demands during recruitment to, to really stimulate those who go even further than living up to the basic demands of a code of conduct. 
Great, thanks Christian. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in now and I, I know we're not going to get to them all today, but let me just grab one and then for each of the questions we don't get to, again, please, uh, please do email us. We're happy to help and uh, look forward to receiving those. Um, Nicholas, to you, who are the verification partners that TCO Development works with for social responsibility verification? Yeah, one of the one of our verification partners are listed on our web page under under that headline, and uh, we are working with uh, uh, mostly three major test houses called Intertech, TIF Rhineland, and Nemco, and they have uh, they are multinational companies with with large organizations, and there are both uh, they have. Uh, specialized verifiers who are uh, who are uh, who have been working as factory auditors and they are uh, qualified according to to um, SA Towson Advanced Auditor system or or equal to that uh, and they are working to review the the audits from the factories and the code of conduct and these documentations so that our staff at TCO Development uh, thus will will not make the judgment. We will we will leave the judgment to an independent third party, and we will base the decision uh, of certification on that independent judgment. Okay, um, we have one minute left, and there's a number of questions. I'm going to wrap them into one question, and maybe Nicholas, you can give us a super fast answer. Um, we have a number of questions about what are future requirements um, that are coming up for TCO certified future criteria, and how are we going to go about developing that process? So I'm thinking maybe you could talk a little bit about the stakeholder process, Nicholas, and, and that process moving forward really quickly. Yeah, so we, we are now in the first year of a three-year development period. We will launch our new generation in, in three years from now. We are now in the phase where we are collecting ideas about new criteria and in the next year we are going to do the research and, and the projects to evaluate the ideas we collect this year. Um, we think from our experiences of this the last years we worked with it that it's important to have a leadership from the brand owner the brand owner leadership in this is is crucial to achieve uh, real improvements on the factories and um, we have we have made some increased criteria on that. The generation we launched in November last year. But we believe that this is an area where we where we will continue to raise our requirements in the coming certification. Uh, we are also looking at, at many other different parts that could be included, but uh, the criteria that we have set today uh, is 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 still challenging for many brand owners and uh, and the important part of it is to to have a closed loop to say that you fulfill something it's one thing but to have the closed loop where where the the progress is monitored and audited and then all the findings are corrected and you can see that that the, there are real improvements in the factories. This is the closed loop that we want to achieve before we include even more parts into our social criteria. And to to achieve that, we we it's necessary to have a leadership from the brand owners who who will drive this change in the in the factories. Thanks, Nicholas. And just to round off there, uh, later this year we will be reaching out to our purchaser, uh, industry, all our stakeholder contacts for uh, a dialogue about upcoming criteria areas and uh, 
we very much welcome stakeholder input into that three-year process, as Nicholas mentioned. So with that, we've gone slightly over time, but thanks everyone for staying with us. I think it was a great conversation, and I certainly hope that you got some actionable information out of today's session. This session will be recorded and available on demand. We'll be sending out information about that within the next few days, and we look forward to you joining us on our next webinar, so look out for that announcement coming in the next few weeks. Thanks again, everyone, and have a good day or a great evening wherever you might be. Bye-bye now.